for the introduction. I would like to start by thanking the Rachel Carson Center and LMU for hosting this. I thank Daniel Duma for moderating this talk, the IT team for their support, and of course, all of you for being here. So in this talk, I'll present the key themes in this project, the central argument, and the indigenous ecological and cultural practices from the Kodagu Coffee District in India. So these are some of my key overviews. The idea and practice of becoming bioregional. One of the central themes of this project is to understand how to become bioregional. I will describe the two main bioregional concepts, living in place and re-inhabitation, and show that bioregional living is not just an idea or a literary imagination, but also an action-based practice that includes the common people. So in this project, I will discuss what is bioregional living and how to become bioregional. Kodagu environmental, cultural, and socio-political history since 1750. So the second central theme of this project introduces the bioregion here, Kodagu. I will talk about the geographical and socio-political history of Kodagu to explain why Kodagu can be considered a bioregion. Kodagu is the seventh largest coffee producing destination in the world today. So I will look at the places environmental, cultural, and social history throughout the pre-colonial, colonial, and post-colonial times to explain why bioregional re-inhabitation is so important in Kodugu. The last or the third sign uh, overview, significance of Kodava uh, re-inhabitory strategies and how they help revive communal knowledge systems and indigenous ecologies of place. The third central theme is to identify the Kodugu ecological and cultural practices to understand to what extent these practices qualify as re-inhabitory strategies and help the community to restore their land and revive their indigenous tradition. So, uh, so this picture uh, I have collected from the Madikeri archives. It shows the 90, late 19th century deforested Kodugu landscape. Now, photography was introduced in India around 1840s. This picture is from the collection of Oriental Races and Tribes, which was published by uh, William Henderson and William Johnson. So in Kodugu, the introduction of non-native coffee caused massive deforestation, as you can see, resulting in environmental degradation, topographical transformation, and loss of biodiversity threatening the indigenous ecology and traditional knowledge rooted in place. So in this project, I'll argue how the Kodawa native people attempted to re-inhabit their land. The second picture is what a coffee plantation looks today. So I photographed this from in 2017 from one of my host's coffee plantation in Kodagu. The last photograph uh, shows the mountainous view of the Kodugu landscape in the 21st century. So after this process of re-inhabitation, which is also, which includes reforesting the plantations. So uh, I took this picture from Baga Mandala, which is the highest peak in Kodugu. Now Baga Mandala is also very important in the Kodugu geographical context because it is the source of the main watershed in South India, which is Kaveri. So in Kodagu, the source means Tala, so Bagamandala is also known as Tala Kaveri. Now in Kodagu, the average size of a coffee plantation is approximately 100 acres, which is spread across the slopes of the Kodagu mountains. Most of them are privately owned by the Kodawa native people, 
but some of them are also leased to the corporate firms such as the Tata. Just to introduce briefly, Tata is India's one of the most prominent business conglomerate with a market capitalization of about $242 billion in 2021 and they are the largest tea and coffee exporter in India. So, now these are some of the broad topics that shape my book. I will first walk you through the bioregional concepts in case some of you are not much aware of so that it helps to understand what is it like to become bioregional. Now bioregion etymologically means life place according to one of the prominent bioregional scholars Robert Thayer Jr. This concept of bioregion was introduced in, was developed by Peter Berg in 1977 in his unpublished essay, Strategies for Reinhabiting the Northern California Bioregion. But in 1978, he developed the concept further and published it in their seminal essay, uh, Reinhabiting California, along with his friend and colleague, the biologist Raymond F. Dasman. They defined bioregion as a geographical terrain and a terrain of consciousness about how to live in the place. To identify a bioregion, the place needs to have a prominent geographical marker distinct from its adjacent region. It can be the soil type, it can be the mountains, the forests, or the watershed, any prominent geographical marker which is very distinct from its adjacent region. Also, Becoming bioregional focuses on organizing all economic, social, and cultural activity around the naturally defined region. So these are the two main bioregional concepts, living in place and reinhabitation. Both were introduced by Peter Berg and Raymond F. Dasman in their seminal essay, Reinhabiting California in 1978. Now, living in place means living in harmony with nature and knowing the processes of the planet, such as seasons, weather, water cycle, soil type. The primary purpose of living in place is to ensure long-term occupancy of the site and maintaining the, a balance with the natural resources available in the region. Reinhabitation, on the other hand, means living in place in an what I call an injured land. By injured land, I mean any land which is naturally or hum by humans exploited. Uh, so it's kind of an exploited or a disrupted land. Now, uh, reinhabitation is considered an idea or a literary imagination by Cheryl Glotfelty, Carla Amberser, and Tom Lynch in their famous book, Bioregional Imagination. It is also considered a practice by Richard Ivanoff, Vince Michael McIgins, so some of the bioregionalists. So to understand whether reinhabitation is both or it is a practice, for my research, I studied all the 22 definitions of reinhabitation available till date from the inception of the concept and try to analyze this and uh, to my conclusion I found that it is more a practice rather than being a mere idea. So I can talk about this later in some work in progress sessions. Now bioregional living includes both living in place and reinhabitation. And it can be practiced in both a healthy landscape as well as in an exploited or a disrupted land. Now the anglicized name of Kodugu is Kurg, so it's more popularly known as Kurg. And also it is known as the called the Scotland of India. So you can imagine the terrain, the mountainous, the mountainous terrain of Kodugu. The people of Kodugu are called the Kodava people. Now they have a distinct culture, language, food habit, geography and ecology from their adjacent region. 
They manage to organize the economy and cultural activity around their naturally defined region. So Kodagu can be made to be a bi-region. This will become more prominent later in my talk when I'll be talking about re-inhabiting Kodagu. Okay, so uh, if you look into the map of India, no, sorry. Uh, this is Kodugu. So Kodugu, the other name of Kodugu is Kodu Mail, which means mountains in Kodugu. And Kodugu is situated in the eastern slope of the Western Ghats in India. Now Western Ghat is actually a kind of a mount, tropical mountainous forest. It is also a global uh, biodiversity hotspot. Now it is situated in the present state of Karnataka. Now this map is the map of southern India. So we have four prominent states, Karnataka, Kerala, Tamil Nadu, and Andhra Pradesh. So Kodagu here, also it has this river called Kaveri, which flows through this Tamil Nadu, which is the, called the rice bowl of India. So that river and the source is very important. Uh, So if you look into the map of Kodugu, we have three talukas, which is called the governorate. Now Madikeri is of approximately 1400 square kilometers, and this is the main urban center of Kodugu. Just adjacent to it is the smallest taluka or governorate, pink in color. It is the Somwar pit of about 1000 square kilometers. And here we have the largest taluka or governorate, which is Virajpet. Now Madikeri is very close to Bagamandala and it receives the maximum amount of rainfall. Now water is very essential for coffee, but receiving too much of rainfall doesn't produce very rich coffee. And also Madikeri is uh, also, you know, the Arabica coffee is the main, is mainly cultivated in Madikeri. Somwarpet and Virajpet have both the varieties Arabica and Robusta coffee. Uh, Somwarpet is very important in the Kodagu district because uh, it is the smallest taluka, but also compared to Madikeri and Virajpet, it produces the largest yield of fruits, vegetables, crops, and along with coffee. Uh, the socio-political uh, context of Kodugu is a bit uh, complex. So the coffee was introduced to Kodugu from Ceylon, which is the present day Sri Lanka. Now Ceylon had been the top coffee growing country in the world since the mid 17th century. Now at present it is Brazil. So from 9, 1872 onwards, Ceylon's coffee production seriously declined because of the leaf rust disease. So leaf rust is a disease which rapidly spreads along the coffee plantation, destroying both the plant and the coffee. Kodugu's moist, dark, soiled, mountainous region at an elevation of about 1800 feet above sea level became the most appropriate and alternative source for European colonizers to establish coffee plantations there. It was exactly during that time, the 1878 Indian Forest Act was established. The 1878 Indian Forest Act authorized the replacement of Indian forests with all the, the major cash crops, such as tea, coffee, indigo, rubber, potato plantations. The act allowed huge forest lands of about 1,000 hectares. Now, one hectare is approximately 10,000 square meters or uh, 2.47 acres. So imagine about 100 hectares of land being given to the colonizers for one rupee, which is approximately one US pence. So the introduction of the non-native coffee brought an immense loss of biodiversity threatening Kodugu's ecosystem and transforming the place into an injured land. So it, is, it was for this reason the Kodava people found the necessary to re-inhabit their land. 
So this uh, two maps are from 2017. It is after rehabilitation. So sorry. Uh, so this is the forest cover map. So this dark green patches are the dense forests. This also house the sacred groves. Now sacred groves form a very crucial part of Kodagu culture. With the loss of the, plantation, the forest to the plantations, the sacred groves were also lost, but now they are, they are in, in shape again. So these green are the, the deeper light green, the borders are the normal forests. The light green in the middle represents the agricultural land, both coffee and paddy. If you look into the land use map, the yellow rep represents the agricultural land, both coffee and paddy. The pink are the grazing land or the grasslands. The green are forests, moderate to very dense. Just running a few uh, stats. About 2,000 square kilometer of moderately dense forests, approximately 950 square kilometers of open forests, and 250 square kilometers of very dense forests. This is after re-inhabitation, so in the 21st century. Okay, so re-inhabiting Kodugu. Uh, now re-inhabitation, according to most of the bioregional scholars, like Peter Berg, Raymond F. Dasman, Kickpatrick Sale, Gary Snyder, both the settlers and the natives could re-inhabit their land, but they have mainly talked about settler re strategies. Uh, here, as I mentioned in my argument, and as I'm telling, that it is the Kodogu people who are re their own land. So I will discuss how the indigenous ecological and cultural practices help the community to restore their land and revive their lost traditions, making these practices bioregional. So the European method of coffee plantation was to grow coffee under direct sun. This worked well for a few decades. For few decades, I mean from 1880 to about 1930. But eventually, the soil began to become very dry and massive topsoil erosion compromised the quality and quantity of coffee. Now, this is the problem of present-day Vietnam. The central highlands of Vietnam have, are facing this kind of problem today, which we faced in uh, somewhere between 1930s and 1940s. Coming back to Kodugu, so sometime in the 1940s, the Cordova people discovered an indigenous method of coffee cultivation. They observed that because Kodogu was situated at a higher altitude than Ceylon, coffee in Kodogu was getting too much sun. Based on this hypothesis, they decided to grow coffee under native shade trees, such as orange, jackfruit, sandalwood, cluster fig, which is very popular in Kodugu. It is also known as athi trees. This helped restore the native ecology of the place, turning coffee plantations into what I call mini forests. So if we look, these are the unripe coffee berries. This is what a coffee plantation looks today. So it is from one of my hosts, Rani Makhaya's coffee plantation. As you can see, this is papaya, uh, this is pepper, uh, these are the shade trees, and here, these dark green small shrubs are the coffee plants. So this had certain advantages. It helped in getting back the canopy cover, which houses various species of birds, animals, and insects. So gradually, the native biodiversity is being restored, along with the production of more coffee than that was produced under direct sunlight. Now, uh, from 1940 onwards, this reforestation or re-inhabitation is in practice. So now, at present, of almost after 80 years, it seems we have reached a state of what is called functional native biodiversity. So the regrowth of the native forests also helped to retain the soil moisture and recover the topsoil. And finally, as we all know, the regrowth of the forest helps in carbon sequestration. 
now I will uh, talk about the two prominent, two main uh, plants which are very much seen on the Koragu plantations and how they help in, uh, to the, uh, how they really help coffee. So the first one is cardamom. The roots of the cardamom contain a large amount of potassium, iron, and aluminum oxides. These oxides firmly fix soluble phosphates into insoluble ones and enhance the soil's mineral content. So cardamom cultivation on the coffee plantation helps in restoring the topsoil. Also, cardamom is one of the main flavoring agents of traditional Cordova food. These days, almost every Cordova household plants cardamom on their plantations. This is because it enhances the soil quality, as I mentioned. And in the last decade, the cardamom prices were very high. So when the coffee prices are down, often the Cordova people sell cardamom to ease their financial burdens. We also know that India is very famous for spices. So this cardamom export over the last decade has gone up. So this really helps, in the financial, helps financially as well as the soil. Now, uh, these are the cardamom plants. These are cardamom pods, and this is the root. So he is the expert or the um, manager of Rani Makhaya's coffee plantation, who looks into the cardamom and pepper. So the next one is pepper. Now, the coffee in Kodugu is vulnerable to leaf rust, the disease that I mentioned. It is also called the Bora attack. Now, instead of spraying chemicals, the Cordova people use an indigenous solution made of fresh river water from Kaveri, turmeric paste, ground black pepper, and dried neem leaves, all abundantly available in the region and native to the place. They believe these plants have medicinal and antibacterial properties. Specifically, pepper acts as a strong repellent to leaf rust. So pepper plants on the plantation restrict the leaf rust disease and its spread. Pepper, as you can see, is a climber. So from the ground level to the top level, the entire forest is protected from the leaf rust, uh, from the leaf rust disease. It also encourages mid-level canopy growth, which in turn helps in regain regaining the lost biodiversity. Pepper also allows moss to grow at the ground level, which helps the soil retain moisture and maintain the topsoil from eroding. Also, like cardamom, pepper is another crucial flavoring agent in the traditional code of a food, and it shares similar financial benefits as well. In the 20th century, it, is noticed, it was noticed towards the end of the 20th century, from 1990 onwards, the natives were clearing acres of Arabica coffee and planting pepper instead. Also, because pepper is largely exported from India. So finally, I'll be talking about the cultural practices. Now, there are prominently three major cultural practices in Kodugu. One is uh, the Puthari, or the Harvest Festival. Another is the Kaveri Sankaranamya, which is the uh, festival to celebrate the birth of River Kaveri. But the most prominent one is Kelpod, or the Festival of Arms. So here, I'll be talking of only one festival, which is Kelpod. Now, uh, if Kelpod is also called Kel Muhurta. So in pre-colonial times, when the Cordova people were hunter-gatherers, the celebration of Kelpod marked the commencement of the hunting season. In those days, the Cordova people worshipped their hunting equipment and set out for their first hunt. On returning, they had a grand feast with their family and friends. Now, when the forests were lost to the plantations, Celebration of Kelpo became incomplete, uprooting the Kodava culture. So for a few decades, it was completely stopped. But then, in the 20th century, with the regrowth of the forests, Kodava again started to be celebrated every year on 3rd September. Even today, it is celebrated every year on 3rd September. 
But by then, the scenario had completely changed in India. Hunting is now completely banned. So they do celebrate Kelpo, but in a very different way. They, at present, decorate their ancestral hunting and agricultural equipment. And uh, like if you see this particular uh, picture, these are all ancestral hunting equipment uh, decorated with one particular flower, which is orange and yellow color flower. So I'll come to this later. So this are uh, Mr. and Mrs. A B uh, B P Apanya. So they are the community elders. Now in Kodugu community, there are certain community elders who are trying to give pass on the tradition or the culture to the younger generations. So it is they are worshiping, and these are the ancestral agricultural equipment. Since the pre-colonial times. Women played a very crucial role in Kodava hunting. A small girl, like in the pre-colonial times, the children, the young small girls were taught how to tame or how to chase the animals. And they had a particular name for that called Batekara. Now, because hunting is not there, but this tradition, the way to respect women, is still continues. So at present, to celebrate the commencement of the hunting season, the women of the house shoot coconut, just to declare that, uh, that it, is the, it is the inaugural of the hunting season, and it is also a way to show respect to their ancestors. So uh, here in this picture, she's the elder of the house who is aiming a coconut. The other customs include traditional attire, and inviting, uh, wearing the traditional attire. Now, uh, these are the traditional attire. Now, in India, national dress is sari, which is a six yard long cloth. It can be cotton or silk. But the way the Kodava people wear the sari, so this part is what we call the anchal, um, so which we generally put it at the back, the whole pan India. But in Kodagu, they put it in, fr they, they, wear, they drape it in a way so that it falls in front. Now this is a way to show respect to the river Kaveri so that it continues floating. We are not turning, like, they believe that if that archel is at the back, then you are turning away from the river. So their soil will dry up. But if you wear it in a way which it is in front, so you are kind of showing respect to the river and allowing it to flow. So, uh, and they also invite uh, their friends and family for a grand traditional feast cooked up with local ingredients. Now it's very interesting, most of the local ingredients are at, in the time of Kelpod are collected from their sacred groves. Now most of the year it is closed because the forest has not grown up in its full length. So uh, only during Kelpod and Putari, this forest's sacred groves are open and it's the children who go out and collect the fruits and vegetables. So this uh, particular flower that I showed you at the front when I, at the beginning when I was talking about the uh, decoration of the instrument uh, plays a very crucial role in Kelpod. Uh, this is the orange yellow flower which is called Raja Kirita in Kodugu and gun flower in English. It's called gun flower because uh, later on, uh, like when they were going for hunting, they used, used to guns. And it is used purpose mainly for this celebration of Kelpod. So they call this flower gun flower. These gun flower blooms for about a week at the end of August every year in the forests of Kodugu. Now with the loss of biodiversity, the flowers were lost too, making Kelpod incomplete. But with the regrowth of the forests, these gunflower groves are now found in abundance on the forested plantations. The children play an essential role in walking through the forests, searching for the gunflower and collecting them for decorating the ancestral equipment, both hunting and agricultural equipment. This helps them to know their land and ecology of the place. Also, when the children decorate their ancestral arms and equipment, the elders of the house or the community elders narrates them stories about the commun about the ancestors about their ancestors and also about uh, hunting uh, like how it was in the, during their ancestral times 
So this kind of storytelling be itself became, becomes a rehabilitatory tool to memorize the past traditions and revive the Kodava culture. So to conclude, I would like to say that it is true that the non-native coffee plant turned Kodagu into an injured land, but the Kodagu indigenous ecological and cultural practices are re-inhabitory in nature. These re-inhabitory approach shows how the plantation system can be integrated with the Kodagu ecosystem to help recover the lost ecology and indigenous culture. Thank you. Thank you for your time and for listening.